You know, to be honest, when I saw the title of my lecture, because I didn't provide the title, I thought, <laughs> okay, um, what, did the, what do they really want me to talk about? Um, uh, general basics or principles or chemotherapy, history, evidence and future, or maybe essential medicines, but it's in parentheses. Then, then, I, then I noticed, well, there should, should be a comma behind history because this is not very exact English. I mean, at least the British people should support me. Uh, maybe it should be um, like this. And then I thought, well, no, no. Um, maybe we need to change the whole thing and uh, talk about evidence and history, or shall we talk about essential medicine? So I decided we start with essential medicines. Um, <clears throat> and you uh, are all aware, I'm 100% sure, that there are these clinical practice guidelines available. And this is actually a really major achievement of um, uh, Yang Sao P, together with some of the old chaps, um, to develop such guidelines, and they are available. Um, and it was actually CCI Europe, in particular from Eastern Europe, uh, demanding or asking for this because it's not available. And to be honest, I was not aware that this is not um, available in all countries. So one of the first has been the one uh, that um, Camelo coordinated uh, for ALL. <coughs> and it's available, and here you see the people who um, contributed to this, and uh, I had the honor to review uh, the procedure, and I have to say it was a lot of fun. And also, um, Kathy already pointed out to that, uh, WHO has built a list of essential medicines that has been updated last year. <clears throat> and this is not um, to entertain people at the WHO and, and to find work for them. It is really essential because it can be used as a political instrument to, to demand that these uh, medications are available. So this is not only on oncology agents, it's medicines for children, please remember. But on chapter, oops, on chapter 8.2, you find the antineoplastic agents, and uh, you are familiar with this aspartaginase. You may have heard it's a pretty important uh, agent in <laughs> therapy, <laughs> and bleomycin. We have heard about. Well, so this is a fantastic achievement, and if this can be used. Um, in particular in low-income countries to get these uh, agents on the, uh, into the distribution in the health system, it's, it's useful. On the other hand, we should be uh, honest, this list does not prevent shortages because even in the highly developed countries, we are uh, experiencing, experiencing uh, shortages in agents which are not very expensive because the expensive ones are always available, <laughs> but the less expensive ones, like uh, actinomycin D, for example, they are only produced at one or two places in the world, and if there's a quality problem, it's not there anymore. And this happens uh, more frequently now. Serious, uh, serious topic, not maybe for this course. <clears throat> so, now we get into the history part. It's still the same title. I just changed the <laughs> font a little bit. <clears throat> and I will give you some examples because um, I thought, well, you know, uh, I look very old. You look very young. I'm pretty sure that most of you were not even born. I mean, except for you, Andy Show, of course. Uh, when some of these studies were done, and it is a big pleasure to listen to, uh, to, to show this after these fantastic lectures in statistics, because this is completely without any statistics. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just to summarize, this was the very beginning in leukemia treatment, the studies by Farber, uh, even in 1948 in the New England Journal, temporary remissions in ALA. In acute leukemia, not ALA. At that time, they were not so sure what is ALA and ALA. 
using a single agent, aminopterin. Um, the first remarkable thing, um, temporary remissions. Just think about it. To, uh, I, I finished my lecture later on with 90% survival. Uh, so temporary remission means every patient will die. What a major change. Second thing is, even though you have no survivors, you get into the New England Journal. Uh, That's also pretty funny. <clears throat> and then um, the second paper showed that you can place hormone therapy into the treatment of a malignant disease. Interesting observation. And then 6MP came into the observation. And I will talk again uh, about 6MP in the next few slides. <clears throat> So um, when this review was uh, published in 1965 in Cancer Research, that was the expected range of effectiveness, something we don't use as an endpoint <laughs> nowadays. But anyway, uh, for steroids, 40 to 85 percent. Uh, where is our, yeah, you, 40 to 85 percent, that's quite a range, I think. <laughs> For steroids, folic acid antagonists, uh, metotrexate, am amitopterine, and so forth, 25 to 55, 6MP, 45 to 70%, cyclophosphamide for acute leukemias, only 10 to 35%, and vincristine, 55 to 85%. So I'm showing this slide not because of these ranges, mainly because of the drugs which were available or in the minds of doctors in 1965. So basically we are talking about five substances. Percent remission doesn't mean cure. Again, this is not, not the same. And when Freireich uh, published this in 1963 in Blood, again to me a very, um, first I thought, oh my god, they randomized 6MP versus placebo. You know, this would be considered completely unethical nowadays. It's not a randomized study. It is, the expectation was you cannot survive the disease. But if you give 6MP, you can live a little longer. Do we have a situation like this in pediatric oncology still? In which disease? Hmm? Exactly, but I think nobody would give placebo to a child. This is considered, no, this is a serious issue because sometimes it's been discussed, but you would always use best standard of care. For example, agent XY versus radiotherapy or something which is considered standard of care in, in glioma maybe. The other thing which is interesting at that time is that th uh, out of the 62 patients, three had AML and five had an unclassified leukemia. So this even is the possibility that they didn't have leukemia. Uh, it's just it's a side note. <laughs> <clears throat> then Sulzer in 1964, very, very soon after that, started the first, um, I would say, combination therapy. You know, only two drugs, six. MP and prednisone uh, at the induction of leukemia treatment, metotrexate uh, at a very low dose. What was the result? Uh, the so-called stem cell leukemia. Uh, well, uh, let me show, try to get the laser here. Uh, the stem cell leukemia, 205 cases. Uh, this is this curve as compared to the um, other acute leukemias here, <clears throat> B, 80 cases, but still pretty frustrating result. They all died. And this is not that long ago. I think this is um, remarkable. Anyway, time went on and other people um, came to the field, <clears throat> uh, in particular the people from St. Jude. Donald Pinkel and uh, Joe Simone, and they published the so-called total therapy. The expression by itself, I think, is amazing. <laughs> Not only the name of the first author, uh, um, <laughs> for a German. <laughs> uh, 
The sad thing is he just died a few days ago, by the way. Uh, but 95, 95 years old. I think it's, a, it's okay in a way. And he's a very, very nice person. I, I met him once. Anyway, um, so that is the outcome of the first five total therapy studies. Um, there are many things remarkable. First of all, uh, the outcome is pretty poor, except for the last one, this one, number five. But look at the number of patients. Talking about patient numbers in the Hodgkin study <laughs> and patient numbers here, it is uh, interesting that with this very small number of patients, you, you do something which was then uh, repeated by many investigators worldwide. What was the concept? To give uh, intensive radiotherapy, cranial spinal radiotherapy to kids with leukemia. And in study five, also intrathecal metrotrexia. Unfortunately, what is missing in these first five studies? It's not randomized, I know. There's no arm with intrathecal metrotrexia alone. That would have been a unique chance. Yeah? And that was a, a, something which was later, many years later, was tried to be, uh, tried, uh, was introduced, I would say. So I left this slide in German uh, because it is a German study by Riem in Berlin. And what is not so clear from this slide, which I didn't produce myself, I took it from a nice set of slides that my co-worker Anja Mörike produced, is this first part. I will show you in detail. It, it's only slide blue here, but it's the cornerstone of the success which then came uh, because it was something very courageous. Probably nowadays you would not get it through. I'm 100% sure you would not get it through. That was this. Combination chemotherapy for ALL patients. You're all used to this or similar regimen. The differences between, for example, the NOFO regimen and the BFM regimen, uh, the Dana Farber and the BFM, and all the other different regimen, FRAL and so forth. The only difference is the timing of certain drugs. The drugs are always the same. So, what is um, unique about this? Would you notice? Can you see? What is different for if you compare it to today's approach? Hmm? Radiotherapy. Eliminated. Right. What else? What else? Dosing is in milligrams per kilo. Interesting. But it's only a detail. If you, if you recalculate it on square meter, it's about the same. Aspargenase is given every day. Why? Hmm? It's not pegulated, yeah, but it, I, rem I remember very well the days of non-pegulated aspargenase. It was given every three days. So why was it he given here every day? Because the dose was much smaller, yeah, okay? And also, uh, it was given sub-Q very often, <clears throat> which is possible, of course. Um, so what happened to these patients when they received this type of induction, induct induction consolidation? What was the main criticism? What happened on conferences when this was presented with the results? Toxicity, exactly. <laughs> what type of toxicity? Aspargenase was not the leading toxicity. S say again. Okay. Uh, hematological toxicity, which by itself is not that bad if you do blood transfusions, but what was the consequence? Infections, exactly. So, uh, why did patients die? Sepsis. And what was not available, uh, was not considered at that time? Prof. Prof. 
prophylaxis. Yeah. No, no, not fungal prophylaxis. Trimocystis. So, patients died of pneumonia. And it was pretty frequent at the beginning, and, and therefore, when the results, which were these, um, first, uh, I don't know, 73 patients were presented, um, it was the reaction of the, of the colleagues has not been, wow, some, now we have durable remissions, cure in 53%. Mm -hmm. No, the reaction was, you killed patients by the treatment. And then you can, of course, uh, ask the question, what is uh, more important? And what, what changed during those years? Supportive care. Yeah. Okay. So what were the subsequent aims? Improving results through risk-adapted therapy. Because here, in this trial, there was no risk-adapted therapy. Everybody got the same. Okay? which makes sense. If you have a disease with a zero survival, <laughs> you don't need to talk about risk adaptation. <laughs> but then, of course, this started. And people knew, of course, that, uh, that radiotherapy and certain agents to uh, small kids in particular are too toxic. So one started to talk about treatment reduction and intensification. But first of all, you need to know risk factors. And therefore, for example, here, um, uh, the, the BFM group started to use the so-called risk index. It's a combination of white blood cell count, CNS involvement, thymus involvement, organ involvement, age, and so forth. So it was the first cornerstone in the development to talk about the risk index as, as a parameter. Then the cell mass, shown here, based on peripheral blast count, liver size, spleen size. And you get already, if when you apply these factors, a pretty nice separation of risk groups. So that was introduced in 81, 90, in study 81, which is always indicating the year where this started. And then, um, again, we made a very remarkable observation that this initial uh, blast reduction in the peripheral blood, not here in English, <laughs> um, is of prognostic relevance. That was a, pretty much uh, exactly the time when I joined uh, his group. And um, this finding, as someone mentioned uh, during this uh, talk, uh, during this course, was uh, really useful because you don't need uh, high technology to determine the number of blasts in peripheral blood to predict outcome. Mark, if I remember correctly, this was a finding by chance because the treatment was needed to avoid chemotherapy. And one was no, I'm not 100% sure. That's not true. Both, both is true, basically. Of course, it was also introduced to reduce the, re the early uh, complications with cell lysis syndrome. But also to to because I remember so well because there I started and I had to go everywhere and listen to that and blah blah blah, uh, <coughs> and we counted and we d developed models how to do the prednisone response the best way and, and so I'm quite sure that this <laughs> was important. Anyway, um, counts after one week of prednisone. Uh, it called, it's called the prednisone response. Who is from Belgium? You are, you are from Belgium. It was our Belgian colleagues from the URC. She said, no, it's not the prednisone response. Why not? They were right. There is also intrathecal metrotrexate. If you leave the intrathecal metrotrexate out, and I showed you here the outcome, it's, it's about Rough, nearly 10% of the patients who have prednisone poor response. If you leave the IT metotrexate out, what is the percentage of patients with a poor response to prednisone? 20%, twice as much. So it's, it shows that this intrathecal metotrexate has a profound uh, uh, significance in, in terms of blast reduction. So response, and then the next thing was 
to look at the end of induction remission um, by morphology, by the way. Um, and it showed that there's a small, small group of patients who are not in remission by morphology at the end of induction. Of course, they have a poor outcome, but they don't all die. It's important to remember uh, there are patients, even with sometimes favorable genetics, who still respond to the uh, uh, next agents. So cytogenetics arrived, and of course we found major differences, in particular between those um, poor patients who had 411 or 922, and uh, the majority of patients who had uh, more favorable cytogenetic subgroups. So that entered the field. Then we had a study uh, where we thought, at least at that time, because COG was also on using that agent while blood cell count would be more useful and then separation by immune phenotype. I'm not going into the details, but this is one of the key studies um, worldwide, I would say, because um, for the first time, people got together and utilized them very modern technology to analyze minimal residual disease. What is unique about this study, nobody probably would be able to do it today, um, is the following. Just look at the schema here. There are nine points to take a bone marrow. You see here. Forget about these red circles. Uh, the red circles are only there because these are the only two time points where we utilize the information. But we collected many more bone marrows. But what was unique? The bone marrow was taken, the results were not released because it was not measured. It was put in the freezer, so it was really blinded prospective study. If you would release the results and give it back to the physicians, you would have an immediate impact on the on the, imp uh, on, on the trial design. And the number of patients was relatively small. That was also unique, shown here in the next slide. Andesia is right. Look at the number of patients. 55 belong to the low risk group. Very few relapses. That was really unique. 55 belong to the intermediate risk group and 19 only to the high risk group. And based on these a few patients, 129 patients, we designed the next study. Pretty big risk, but it worked out fine. <laughs> okay, uh, finish history, and at least without evidence. That was history without major evidence. Now we come to evidence. More. And I only give examples again. This was one of the BFM studies in which radiotherapy pretty early on, uh, was supposed to be replaced by intermediate dose methotrexate. That is the outcome. Unfortunately, the arm with IV methotrexate and no radiotherapy, the red curve, did worse, even though it was not significant, but with regard to the uh, cumulative incidence of CNS relapses, patients who did not have radiotherapy did quite a bit worse. Very disappointing result, because the opposite was expected. If you separate, this is something which is not really allowed from a statistical point of view, if you, well, he's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> if you subdivide these patients and take the goodies and the baddies and looked at the goodies, it was okay. If you looked at the baddies, it really didn't work out. Then, could we avoid delayed intensification? Because the introduction of delayed intensification was one of the other big successes of the BFM group. But we, at that time, we thought for the lowest risk patients, those with really low counts, very good response, blah, blah, one could omit it. <clears throat> Did a randomized study with and without delayed intensification, unfortunately, if you didn't give delayed intensification, the outcome was as bad as in the high-risk group. It's a disappointing result, but nevertheless, it shows the power of a prospective randomized study. I mean, the patient number is actually not even that very, very large, 60 patients. 
And I remember this uh, quite well because we discussed the inter, you talked about interim analysis, and I remember we did an interim an analysis about at this point. And there we had a major discussion in Freiburg at that time. Should we stop? And uh, um, the majority of people wanted then to continue, but later on it was stopped in the, that, no, sorry, that was the 86 study, but uh, nevertheless we had the same problem that the omission of delayed intensification was a major mistake. To do it, yeah. So I think we are more careful now with these uh, questions not to completely omit a, a piece of uh, a treatment and like here, uh, and we only change a few uh, smaller details, I would say. So one uh, other study which um, I think was important was to show if pulses with steroids and vincristine during maintenance, like these, makes uh, or is it of benefit or not? And this was done also together with EURTC and uh, Italy and Austria, of course. Uh, BFM was always with Austria, and uh, the result was quite remarkable because there was no difference at all. Um, it's not so easy to achieve such an outcome. <laughs> uh, uh, so what is the positive message from this slide? You don't need it. The number, numbers is pretty good, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, if you, I don't know, did you ever talk to patients, to parents or patients? Uh, during maintenance and steroid pulses? They say it's worse than all the intensive therapy. Because why? Yeah, because they, well, and what is the problem with the DEXA? They get psychotic. They're crazy and drive you up the, up the wall. Yeah, it's even longer than that. And therefore, I'm, after having seen this result on a really large number of patients, I, I have my, um, how should I, say? I will try to be polite. Uh, there are still study groups which now think they need to do this again. Why are we still doing Why are we still giving Don't ask me, I'm not the investigator. <laughs> Why would you do it again? But there were people uh, who think, well, in our background, it, it may be different. Even though, I have to admit, any, I don't know what the statisticians think, a good randomized study should be done twice. <laughs> because we have also experienced that we have copied something for example, from the COG, a good example is double delayed intensification. Did it again. It looked so convincing, you know, and there was no, no effect at all. And then we talked to our American colleagues and they said, oh, you know, we have g given up on it. It didn't work. <laughs> Even though they published uh, prime journals. Anyway, now, I, my last example is this one here. And I show you the cover because it shows that clinical research is very time consuming, needs lots of investigators, like in the Hodgkin study, but it can be really rewarding to do it. And um, let me show what we uh, looked at. I'm not going into the details of all these randomizations, only this one. Very, very simple question. Can one use dexamethasone at a known doses of 10 milligrams like we do it in delayed intensification, or prednisone as the golden standard in induction. That was it. And the endpoint was event-free survival and cumulative incidence of relapses. And I know it doesn't look very impressive. I should have changed the <laughs> axis, uh, the y-axis. But uh, <clears throat> what do you think? Is it a 
important result in terms of relapse reduction. Um, 215 relapses in the experimental arm, 309 relapses in the standard arm. Well, very suggestive question, of course. <clears throat> yes, this is the biggest decrease in relapse I've ever seen in childhood error. So, great, moving forward, no. We came to a, at a price which was too high. There was a TRM related to the use of DEXA, which did not completely eliminate this effect, but which was, if you look at the comparisons here, very high. And we are not talking about a disease in which the overall survival is 10%. We are talking about a disease in which the overall survival is 80, 90%. And therefore, it's so painful. And the second thing is, among these patients were patients whom you can always successfully treat in relapse. So we are over-treating, obviously, patients with excellent chances of survival. And this is shown uh, here in the EFS, even though this was still significant due to this amazing patient numbers, but survival looked like this. So we gave it up for all our B precursor ALLs, the only Group and there we went into the subgroup analysis was T cell leukemia in which DEXA is useful. We also could not overcome prednisone poor response. Okay, I'm getting close to my end, so you get your lunch before 12. Um, relapses events, uh, non relapse events went down starting from the early 80s to 2000 using prednisone using dexamethasone, something strange happened. Now, we went down with relapses even more, shown here. But for the first time, we see this crossing, that the treatment-related mortality is higher than the expected events or event rate by relapses. This is a very critical point, and one needs to consider how to proceed from here. And uh, when you get to this point, you are at a dilemma. You are at a crossroad. You have to think about any future intervention should avoid that this line is going up even more. Therefore, we have changed a number of the horses, um, but I will not talk about it <laughs> because I was not invited to talk about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> And there must be a reason to come back, of course. <laughs> so, essential medicines, history, evidence, essential medicines. Here's the list of agents used in ALL. It's not 100% complete. I just noticed that one of the recent additions, venetoclax, is not on the list. So, um, why show, am I showing the list? Because all these agents up to here are pretty old. They're not very expensive. Sometimes they are not available, as mentioned. And they, some of them have serious disadvantages. Then there are some first uh, targeted agents like imatinib, clofarabine, nelarabine came on the market. By the way, nelarabine, this is not 100% correct. Why? Nelarabine is RRG, not RRC, RRG. RRG is from the 60s. So it's very smart by the company to sell it now for, I don't know, 200 times more money. It's extremely expensive. Glina is a real new development, and of course there will be more agents coming. Um, that's where we are with essential medicines in ALL. And I think it's good to know, again, it's a forest plot, but <laughs> In this context, I think it's okay because the, 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 the branches are so, so small um, that the major study groups worldwide oops, um, have achieved a 90% overall survival and the differences between the study groups are actually quite small. So what I hoped uh, uh, to be able to show that history is sometimes not too boring 
Secondly, that prospective clinical trials are absolutely mandatory. And of course, uh, uh, one cannot do it without this fantastic collaboration in, in this consortium. And, and I have to mention that I'm very happy that we have two consortia in Europe, uh, actually three, two and a half, one should say, ALIC, BFM, uh, the all together and uh, AOPFM because we can learn so much from each other. And last but not least, I want to thank my uh, co-workers in, in Kiev. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martin. Thanks so much for especially giving this insight into the history, which I think is very, very important uh, to understand. Uh, and uh, very helpful when designing the new trials. And I started to coming to your BFM study committee meetings in 2000. That for me, it was always a pleasure being involved in this group. And, and thanks so much for this, too. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I just have a question for Is there a country whose LL protocol is not BFM backbone? The UK. Yeah. UK? UK yeah. is performing the all-together trial and randomizing again the pulses yeah, for the intermediary patients. Yeah. No for Denmark and Sweden is uh, you are also part, part of, of all-together. Yeah. yeah, but it's hmm? there's a question. In Spain. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Ma right. Martin, may I ask you a question? When I look at the West Berlin study, where I think there were 75 patients, event free survival is 55% with only protocol one and maintenance, unfortunately, cranial irradiation. We have uh, not been able to, to reduce our very intensive chemotherapy during all the last trials, but there are 50% who can be cured with such a short, intense chemotherapy. Yeah. How could we find them? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> the answer is, of course, as you know, not easy. Um, it, but the message is extremely important. Uh, also, you can skip one year of maintenance and you're still un losing or risking uh, uh, only um, uh, increasing the risk of relapse for about. 10 to 20 percent of the patients, but the others don't need it, obviously, uh, because they have long-term survival. Uh, and the same applies uh, also for the other parts of the treatment. However, our own experience with omitting, for example, delayed intensification is very negative. Yeah. And so omitting is uh, much more dangerous than adding something. And that's why if you look at the literature, people always like to add something to a backbone, and because it's much more rewarding. Taking something out doesn't give you a good paper. It take, you are taking a risk that, you, that you're getting worse. Uh, and the uh, example that I showed with uh, radiotherapy versus chemo was not very successful. So later on, other study groups gave up radiotherapy, but they didn't do it randomized. So you don't know which risk you took. Of course, partly it was compensated by some intrathecal treatment. Um, so we need to identify them, yes. <laughs> this is the, the, the key question, and people have looked at um, a genetic analysis but haven't really found um, a, a convincing evidence. Last question. Yes, I was just wondering, you just you showed the, the DEXA results with uh, uh, quite the improvement and at the same time the treatment re related mortality but in the all together we are giving dexamethasone in induction but at lower doses and I w could you comment on that approach so the drug is good but the dose why did we choose 10 first of all because 10 was considered by everybody we asked as the equivalent dose to 60 milligrams of prednisone if you use only 40 milligrams of prednisone in induction then 6 milligrams is the equivalent um, if you use less of a given agent, you, you carry less risk of uh, toxicity, of course, and six is certainly well established because many study groups have used six in the past. 
I would consider it to be as effective as 40 milligrams of prednisone. And there are even studies from the UK, by the way, comparing 40 pred with six, uh, six dex. And so you can do it. Um, you may still have some patients with more infections, but we need to look at the data, and I think this will be uh, controlled quite, quite well. And also, it depends, of course, if you have a four-drug induction or a three-drug induction, because the anticycline increases the toxicity quite a bit. And if it's a three-drug induction, then I think you are on the safe side. 